It says in Proverbs 28, if you have your scripture today, that the wicked man flees, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And that's what this series is all about. When we say roar, we're not talking about decibels. We're not talking about getting louder. Like, you don't need to be the loudest person in your neighborhood. Somebody else has already got that role anyway. You don't need to be the loudest person at your job, the loudest person in your family, the loudest person in your gym. Somebody else probably has already state claim to, I'm the loudest one. We're not talking about volume and decibels, although when a lion roars, it is intense. A lion's roar, they say, is 114 decibels. You're like, is that loud? Well, the maximum allowed decibel level for your headphones or your in-ears is about 105 decibels. So 114 is pretty great. Louder than any concert venue in the city of Atlanta is legally allowed to run the sound during a concert. A lion's roar is loud, but God's not inviting us just to be louder He's saying, I want you to be bold, not loud. The roar is a roar of boldness that is anchored in faith. That's what God is looking for going into this defining decade of the 20s, a church and a people that are bold, and their boldness is anchored in something sure. It's anchored in faith, but faith in something of substance, and we see this right in this proverb. It says that the righteous are as bold as lions. So it connects the idea of the lion roar and boldness, but here's how it does it in an even more powerful way. The Hebrew word for bold in this verse is tied to the word confidence. In other words, to be bold is to be confident, and to have confidence in something makes you bold. And that's what God is looking for, and that's the question he's going to be asking of you and me today. What is your confidence in? Because that's going to determine the root of your roar. And we see this play out in Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 17, and I want you to look at it with me. The first four verses of Jeremiah 17 basically describe the condition of the people. In God's people, it says their sin is written or engraved on their heart. It's engraved on their lives. And the sin is described in these first few verses as even your kids, the generation to come, knows about the high places in the Asherah poles. And they're like, oh, Louie, don't, don't start going down this road. That's why I don't read the Old Testament anymore. I don't know what Asherah poles are and all this you know, weird language that's in here. What Jeremiah is saying is that even when God's people came into the promised land and had seen miracles, signs, and wonders, had witnessed the supernatural power of the living God, Yahweh, Jehovah God, They wanted to make sure that they covered all their bases. So they erected idols on the high places of worship to the God Baal and the God Asherah. And the Asherah pole was just an idol to the God of the nations all around them. And so Jeremiah is opening him up, up, speaking for the Lord, and he says, hey, your sin is written on your heart. Well, what is your sin? It's that you didn't want to go all in in confidence in God, so you covered all your bases. Oh, we love God, but we also want to make sure that we've got this covered. And then he opens this up and lets us see what it looks like beginning in verse 5. He says, this is what the Lord says, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the wasteland. He'll not see prosperity when it comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. In other words, he says to the the man or the woman who says, my roar 
is going to be based in confidence, but the confidence is going to be me, my strength, my ability, my resources, my wisdom, my life, my experience, what I have done, what I can do. That's what I'm going to put my confidence in. Therefore, when my portfolio is up, I'm going to be bold, but when it's down, I'm not going to be so bold. When I get the promotion, oh, I'll be bold, but maybe when things aren't going so well in my business, I'll be a little bit less bold. I'll be bold when I'm healthy, but I'll be less bold if I get a diagnosis that I don't see coming. My confidence is in human flesh, in my strength, in my ability. And he draws a picture for that person, and he says, ultimately, that person is going to look like a bush in the wasteland. Now, that's not a picture that anybody has for your life. I doubt anybody has got like a, a, a print or a painting or something crocheted in a frame in your house that is a bush in a wasteland. Nobody got that greeting card for the new year. Happy New Year. Praying for your big dreams to come true. Go for it. Believe in God. You can do anything. It's going to be a banner year for you. You'll be like a bush in a wasteland. No. But you may have gotten a card with an amazing tree on it with the roots and the branches and the leaves and the picture of this is what God can do in your life. The picture Jeremiah is giving us is an aurora, and a lot of your coworkers are roaring. A lot of people in the world are bold, but their roar and their boldness is based in something that is not firm. Same thing happened in the 1920s. If you love history, you'll love last week's talk. If you didn't, don't love history, ask somebody to give you the thumbnail sketch of our overview of the 1920s. But one thing we didn't drill down in was the credit boom of the 1920s. Before the 1920s, 100 years ago, the credit mindset did not exist in America. I mean, there could have been credit like, hey, let's do a handshake deal. I'll give you 100 bushels of corn. You'll loan me your plow. That was about as much credit as happened in America. There was even a mindset that said, I want to earn my wages, save my money, pay my way, and I don't want to be in debt. But all that changed in 1919. GMAC, the General Motors Acceptance Corporation, which is still in existence under that name until just a few years ago, began to give credit in the installment plan for people to buy automobiles. And the automobile was revolutionizing life. Most people couldn't afford one, even though it was only a couple of hundred bucks to get a Model T Ford. But GMAC came along and said, just pay us a little a month with a bit of interest tacked on, and you can drive a car today. And GMAC changed the mindset and erased the stigma of credit and debt in America. In five years' time, there were there was a massive proliferation of credit organizations, and you could buy anything you wanted on the installment plan. And because automobile debt had changed the mindset, people were now buying their radio and their washing machine and their refrigerator on the installment plan. And it was a false sense of confidence. It was like, hey, look at our new refrigerator. Now, now we don't actually own the refrigerator. General Electric owns a refrigerator. We're just paying them eight bucks a month with some interest tacked onto the top so that we have the refrigerator at our house, but it's their refrigerator, just like the car parked in front of the house belongs to GMAC, and the radio belongs to whoever the credit gave us that, and the washing machine belongs to whoever gave us that. But it created a roar, the roaring 20s. But the Roaring Twenties were based in confidence in something that wasn't real. And all of this translates mid-twenties into a stock market boom like no one had ever seen before. The market was just going up and up and up and up. And you say, well, I want to get in on it while the getting is good, but I don't have 500 bucks to put in the stock market. Someone would come along and say, I'll loan you the $500. Invest it in a stock. The market will go up. When the market goes up, triples, you'll sell. 
You'll pay me back the 500 bucks plus a little premium of interest on the loan that I gave you, and then you'll keep the rest. And people were so eager to get into this booming stock market that they were buying stocks on margin, meaning I can't afford it, but I don't want to miss it. October 29th, 1929, the bubble burst, the market crashed, the banks went under, and everybody came knocking on the door, we're going to need to get our washing machine back, we're going to need to get our car back, we're going to need to get our radio back, and I need my $500 back today. And the whole nation went under, and the 30s, the Great Depression, was characterized by the dust bowl. And I'm like, Jeremiah said it. He said, those who trust in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, who turn away from the Lord will be like a bush in the wasteland. And he will not see prosperity when it comes. Isn't it amazing how it's possible that we can roar in the world, but that roar is just confidence in something that Jesus called sinking sand. The man who heard my words, but he didn't put them into practice, and he built his house, but when the winds came and the rain came, the whole house collapsed in the moment. But then he says, there's another way. There's another roar. There's another boldness. There's another kind of confidence. And he describes that man in the next verse. Look what it says in verse seven. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And here's our, our word. Whose, what does it say? Whose confidence is in him. Whose confidence, what does confidence mean? Boldness. Blessed is the man who says, I'm going to dig my foundation on the word of God and the person of God and the character of God. And I'm going to draw my confidence from who God is. Therefore, I'm going to have boldness based on who God is. And here's the result of this man's life. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It le its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Don't you want that life? Man, our news feeds are so full right now, and I'm sort of preaching to a guy about my age today or someone a little bit younger or a family or a single mom, and you're kind of, you know, it's that good year to build up your nest egg because it was a good year for that. So if you're a saver or an investor, you're really happy right now, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm happy that the market was up and returns were great as well. But, you know, you, you read through your feed, and one guy is saying, uh, Dow 40,000 is coming. And then the next guy is saying, uh, so-and-so and so-and-so predicted the market crash of 2008, and they say that the two signs are coming together that predict a similar crash again. And you're like, I don't know who's right. And it can create what? It can create a lack of confidence, which results in a lack of boldness, which results in a lack of a roar. But what if we have trusted God, believed God, done it God's way, and when we read the headlines, we're like, I hope the market does go up, and I really hope that the whole thing doesn't crash and burn. But either way, I am confident because my roots go down into a stream whose river is God, and I'm, <clears throat> I know no matter what season comes that I am going to have leaves on my tree because my confidence and my trust are all rooted in the great I am. It's called margin. You can define it either way. A margin that says we didn't have enough to get the washing machine, but they said if we paid on installments that we could get it right now. We didn't have enough to get that car, but man, the interest rate was low and we're driving it today. We really didn't have enough to get this house, but with the, the multiple year floating variable rate loan that we got, we actually are in this house. We're in all of it on margin, which means our confidence is very shaky. 
everything's got to stay status quo. Or the other way to define margin, God's way, which is leave the border of your crops in case anybody else has a need. Give to God first and trust him to multiply the rest. Do it God's way. Trust in God's character. Let your finances be guided by God's plan. You know what it does? It creates margin. So when the market goes up, you're like, praise God, I got more to give. When the market goes down, you're like, praise God, we didn't leverage it all. And God wants that life for you because that allows you to roar in season and out of season because of your confidence, which is in him. Have you ever gone into an exam before? Not confident, anybody? Just praying to the God of heaven for a miracle? But has anybody, are there smart people here who actually studied and crushed it and you walked into that room and you were so confident because you knew it's stone cold? You know what I'm talking about? And the teaching assistant comes up there and starts passing the exams out, you know, like, can you take one of these, you know, and I don't know why they always do that, you know, can you take one? Here, here, can you take, would you like the flu? Great, awesome. And you can have the flu also and you can have the flu and just take the flu and pass it down, if you will. And when, you, when, you, when it's coming your way, you're not going, Lord, I know you're a merciful God. You're like, give it to me. You get your pen out. I always do that at the end. Like nobody ever finishes that and goes... You better grade that quick because it's going to come bust any minute now. Why were you so bold? Because you were confident. You're in a conversation getting really loud. You ever been in that one? But you actually have the receipt in your pocket. And you're like, no, I'm telling you it was $77. And you're like, $77. $77, being very bold right now, because I have the receipt. <laughs> Mic drop. Why? The confidence in my pocket the whole time. I'm going to be as bold as I want to be. Nobody ever watches the World Series of Poker, but if you did on your way to the inspirational channel... They put little cameras in the side of the table so that when they deal the first two cards, I think that's how poker works, that they um, show the cards to the camera. And if you got pocket aces, some of you are like, is that good? I I don't know. Are there any gamblers here? Are there any, any, any gamblers, any poker players? Is that good? Pocket aces, is that good? And you know it because you're watching in your home and you're like, pocket aces. Jojo has got an eight and a six of differing suits. So you better fold. Because brother over here is sitting on pocket aces. How's he going to play? Very casually. He's got to have his headphones on, his hoodies up, sunglasses, sipping on his Diet Coke. Call. But he knows at some point he's going all in and burying everybody at the table. He's not going to fold. He's going to be bold because he's confident in what he's got. And it works the other way, too. I'll tell you about your pastor in one of the moments where I was the least confident in my life. Uh, was not at Mercedes-Benz Stadium speaking in front of 65,000 people does not make me nervous. It makes me like overwhelmed for the stewardship of what God is doing. That's why I get on my knees and ask the Holy Spirit to do a miracle. But it doesn't like freak me out. It's kind of like having some friends over in your living room. It's just life. Other people, you know, you just say, hey, I want you to come out here and see the stage. There are no people here yet. We're not even starting. But just walk out here. This is amazing view. And they're like, no, I don't want to go out there. I'm good right here. I'll just stop right here. Thank you. Uh, No, thank you. Or if you said, hey, just come say hi, they'd be like, 
hi. You know, it's just the way life is. You, you feel confident in some environments. I feel confident in other environments, and that's not an environment that makes me not feel confident. Hitting a golf ball on a tee in front of 6,000 people at Augusta National at the Masters three-par tournament, that makes me nervous. I got invited by a friend. It's a big privilege to be caddy on three-par tournament day on Wednesday. Families are out there. Kids are out there. Wives are out there. Everybody's got the white caddy jumpsuits on with the player's name on the back, and we're cruising around, and I'm thinking, this is the biggest deal that's ever happened in life. You've heard me talk about it, but what I didn't know about caddying at the three-par at the Masters was that it's tradition that the caddy hits the tee shot on the ninth hole. I haven't hit a golf ball in anything other than like Top Golf, which I haven't even hit a golf ball at Top Golf in years. I don't own golf clubs. And I got to hit a tee shot with three professional golfers, two of whom are Masters champions, standing right here, a major winner right there, me right there. But someone told me, don't worry. It's all water on one side all the way to the green, but there's a little bit of grass on the other side all the way to the green. So all you have to do is skull it and just run it up there. It's only 100 yards to the hole. I was like, I can do that. We get there. It's water everywhere. And then about the size of a nickel over there is the green. Little kid of one of the golfers goes first. 12-year-old, left-handed, fairway wood. Swing looks like a magic. Hits the ball, unbelievable fade, going right toward the hole. I've never rooted against a child in my life. But in that moment, I'm like, please, dear God, let it go in the water. And it did. It's like, thank you. You have many years of apparently being a really good golfer ahead of you. I took that golf club, which I, I took my dad's nine iron because my dad stopped playing golf when he got sick way back when. This golf club weighs 18 pounds. It is an iron. It is made out of iron. There was no alloys. And I walk up there. Okay, if you're a golfer, you already know. It's 100 yards. All you got to do is like get right here and, and give it about that, right? I look like I'm going to drive this ball to Jupiter. <laughs> But thankfully, at the Masters, you're not allowed to take your phones. <laughs> Except on three-par day, you can take a camera. Not a phone, but a real camera. And the guy standing next to Brad Jones had a camera. And Brad said, please video this. <laughs> so I give you, <laughs> you're not confident pastor. Please enjoy. what he said. It's over there. Thank you. I apologize. 
for embarrassing our entire movement. <laughs> the best part of it, two things, three things. A, you can't hear me cuss. <laughs> just kidding. The only thing I was saying was just don't look up and don't slice the ball. That's exactly what I did because I was shaking literally like a leaf. And then the best part was my friend who got me into this, he just says, wow, you could have done that in a whole lot less time. <laughs> I wasn't confident. I'm not playing golf right now. I, I don't feel like, oh, I can just step up and drop a easy 100-yard shot onto a little tiny green that's as slick as this stage I'm standing on that's all water for me to there, and there's 6,000 people watching, and it is the Masters. I can do that. I feel confident. I was not confident in anything about it. Therefore, I was everything but bold, and there was no roar. There was just a little laughter. A few chuckles, and Shelly going, I don't know the man. <laughs> no, I've never been with him. Three times I'll say it. I've never met this man. And so the question today is, what is your confidence in? Is it in, in, in you, in, in the strength of the flesh? Is it in man? Is it in your ability? Is it in what you have? Or is your confidence today, for real, rooted in and drawing nourishment from who God is? Because that's how it happens. How do we get the confidence of Daniel to go in a lion's den and say, hey, I don't know what's going to happen in that lion's den, but I'm going to worship my God. How do we get the confidence of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who say, we're not bowing down to that idol. Our God can save us. But guess what? Even if he doesn't save us, he's so much greater than that idol. We are not bowing down. Well, I believe there are two things in play here. And the first one we mentioned last week, but I want to expand on it a little bit. It starts with revelation. That's how you get a new confidence. We're not looking for New Year's resolutions. If you want to do something and change direction, go for it. But we're talking more about New Year's revelation, not some extra knowledge that nobody's ever gotten. I got a revelation. I was in Arby's and Jesus came in and sat down at my booth and he told me three things that no one's ever heard. I wrote them down. Do you want to know what they are? We're not talking about that. We're talking about a supernatural, eye-opening comprehension and understanding of who God is and what he is doing in the world and what he's doing in your life. Revelation uh, of a great God. Not, I came to church and I know a few books of the Bible and a few of the Jesus stories and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I'm talking about revelation and understanding of who God is. This is how our confidence builds. And this is what it says in the text. This person is going to be like a tree planted by the water that sends its roots by the stream and it doesn't fear when circumstances change. Psalm 1 tells us that tree is planted in the Word of God, which is the person of God, which is the character of God. I'm planting my life in who God is. The psalmist says it this way, Psalm 20, verse 7. This is what the psalmist tells us. Coming up on the screen because I don't have it and I don't have time to turn to it. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some have counted up how many chariots they have. Others counted up how many horses we have. That's what us men are great at. Us men are great at counting all of our accounts and then taking confidence and boldness based on all of our accounts. But the psalmist says, hey, you can have all the accounts, but we're not trusting in how many chariots we've got or how many horses we've got. We're trusting in the name 
of our God. Now, that is a big statement, the name of our God, because what is the name of our God? If I said, hey, take out your phone or take out a pen and quickly write down the names of God that are giving you confidence right now in your life, how long would your list be and how quickly could you make it? Well, if your roots are in here, if you're daily sinking down in here, who God is is becoming clearer and clearer to you. And when you say, oh, I'm not counting on chariots and horses, I'm trusting in the name of the Lord our God. Oh, and let me tell you what his name is. What do you mean, what his, what his name is? Check it out. I just put a few up here. I mean, it could be a whole lot more. His name is Jehovah Jireh, God provides. You can say a little amen if anything hits you the way uh, it feels right. Jehovah Rapha is his name, which means God heals. His name is El Shaddai, God Almighty. His name is Ancient of Days. His name is I Am. His name is Defender, Deliverer, Savior, Sin Bearer. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. His name is Prince of Peace, King of all kings, Sustainer, Life, Life Giver, Breath, Guilt remover, just, justifier, righteous, Lord, friend, perfect father, lamb who was slain, grace, resurrection and life, beginning and end, first, last. He is the architect, the creator, the designer, the builder, the foundation, the debt canceller, the star breather, the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, light of the world, truth. He's Holy Spirit, bright morning star, helper, the word of God, head of the church. He's faithful, consistent, unchanging, good, worthy. He is I am that I am, the redeemer, restorer, victor, champion, death defeater, Jesus. Jesus is his name. That's who he is. That's just a little short list of his name. Come on, let's give God some praise and some worship and some honor today. He has a name that is above every name. And the proverb writer says about his name in Proverbs 18, it says, the name of the Lord, what name? All of that name is a strong tower, and look, and the righteous run to it and are safe. I'm not just running into some concept of a creator. I'm running into just, and I'm running into designer. I'm running into architect. I'm running into faithful and true. I'm running into healer. I'm running into provider. I'm, I'm running into miracle worker. I'm running into Jehovah Jireh. I'm running into El Shaddai. That's where I'm running. And as a balance to that, the next verse, pretty telling, right back to the roaring 20s. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city, and they imagine it an unscalable wall. They're roaring about their accounts, not remembering 2008 and 1929. The banks can go under. Your company's pension fund can go under. Currencies can devalue. And when they do, guess what? They're going to want your house back. But more than that, relationships can change. People can walk out the door. Circumstances that you don't see coming and have not prepared for arrive. And when they arrive, you're going to want to know that you spent the 20s putting roots down by the stream that is the living waters of Almighty God. And I'll just close and say that, yes, it is all about revelation of who God is, but it's also about memory. It's about remembering his faithfulness. That's where confidence comes from. 
You're like, well, Louie, I'm new to faith and I've messed up my life and I don't really have a great miracle story. I hear people talk about miracle stories. I don't really have the God did this and God did that and God did the other. Listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, every story in here is your story. Hello? Daniel went in the lion's den. You went in the lion's den. He's your brother. And he has your father. So when he went in, you tell that story like I tell a story, 1957 National Championship, Auburn University. The year my dad graduated from Auburn. Natty. I wasn't even born. But I claim it. It's in my arc. And it's in my story. And you've got probably something in your story. The problem is the enemy has given us all spiritual amnesia. In 28 days after a miracle, we're sitting at a latte again with a friend going, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And God's like, run into my name. It's a strong tower. Don't trust in horses or chariots. Trust in the name of the Lord our God and wake up from your spiritual amnesia and remember that it was just like a few weeks ago that I brought you through and go, oh, hello. I'm gonna be bold. I'm gonna just go out on the limb right here and roar a little bit. Why are you gonna do that? Because I'm confident. I'm confident. I've shared some of this story before, but I want to close with it. So we, we're at Mercedes, and people have asked Shelly, me, and our team, how did you guys do that? Like, not literally, like, logistically, but, like, Louie, how did, how did you step up and just say, we're going to do this? How do you and Shelly just say, we're going to rent the most expensive football stadium in America? We're going to host a New Year's Eve gathering. We're going we're gonna to put on a show, if you will, in a stadium that hasn't really had a thousand out of a thousand on a show yet. It's a very difficult place and everybody's trying to figure out how to make it sound and look great. How are you gonna put something on in there that actually sounds better than Beyonce, sounds better than Jay-Z, sounds better than Jason Aldean, where people can preach for 45 minutes and everybody can hear every word? How are you gonna do that? Are you going to overcome the resources, the team, the finances, the challenges, all the no's, and it can't happen, and uh, we're not sure, and we're not thinking that's going to be possible? How are you going to shoot fireworks off the roof? And everybody says, probably can't shoot fireworks off the roof, and on down the list. How can you stand up and say, guys, we're going, we're going to do this? What? I'll tell you why, because I'm Superman, that's why. I go home at night, and when I take this coat off, you would be amazed at what I've got on underneath this jacket right here. No, we're bold because we're confident because even though we do get spiritual amnesia and we're not perfect, we remember and we're standing in Mercedes and I don't know for whatever reason, there's so many different glimpses of our story, but we're standing in Mercedes and I just remember a story that I've told here before. I tell it super fast. We're going toward one day 2000, the biggest gathering we'd ever done to date. 40,000 people coming to Memphis, Tennessee for a solemn assembly. We went coast to coast, city to city, state to state, and told every campus we could find, come to Memphis, Tennessee. God is gonna do something amazing, May 20th, 2000. So this day, I ended up in Berkeley, California at the University of California, Berkeley. That is not the hotbed of friendliness toward the gospel of Jesus. But we sent an invitation around to every campus minister, come to lunch. We want to share vision with you. Please just come. We'll provide the lunch. Send it out to maybe a dozen people. Five came. We met at one of the ministry houses on campus. Everybody gathered. Then we had lunch. I think it was some kind of subs at the time. There were no Jimmy John's. So I don't know what it was. And then as we're like eating the subs and about to go up to this little office kind of room upstairs and show them the One Day 2000 video, these three girls come walking in the door. And they're like, hey, we're here for the passion event. We're like, okay. They're college students. 
They came from Sacramento State University about two hours away because they were campus leaders and got on an email invite that went out to like a radius around Berkeley and Oakland. And they thought, passion's coming to Berkeley? We're not gonna miss that. I guess Charlie Hall will be there and who knows, Crowder might be there. We're going. Did you not notice it was a luncheon? College students, right? They're just like, we're going. So they cut class, made a multi-hour drive, showed up in a room with five college leaders and me and a guy on our team. And we're like, they said, can we have a sub sandwich? Yeah. We went upstairs, we sat around a table, kind of like a conference table. We showed the video of one day and I could feel the tide already kind of turning against us. Everywhere we went and everywhere we've been in 23 years, everybody didn't say, hey, this is the greatest thing ever, awesome. And I could just feel the tide of a couple of the leaders like, man, we don't need this and nobody needs a big event. Nobody needs your thing and we don't know what your video is gonna be about and we're certainly not coming to Memphis, Tennessee. We don't know what happens in the deep south, but we've heard rumors, we're not going. And we played the video and when it ended, the person I felt the most resistance from spoke up and he said well I don't know what the general feeling in the room is but maybe before I share I'd just love to have one of these college students share hear what they think just convinced that it's a no and the girl sitting in the chair right there she said I'd like to say something she reached down underneath her chair and pulled her backpack out and unzipped it and pulled her journal out And before she could even get it open, tears started coming down her face. And she said, if it would be okay with everyone, I'd like to read what I wrote in my journal three days ago. And I'm like, she started to read and she said, dear Lord, I pray that you would start a movement in my generation where your glory and your fame would be known all across this nation. I pray that you would get the glory that you deserve in this nation, north, south, east, and west, that people would come together to lift up Jesus like never before. And God, please do it in my lifetime because I want to be a part of that generation. And then she pointed at the television where the video had played and she said, you can count on me. I'll be at one day 2000 in Memphis, Tennessee. And I mean, there was no time to gloat. I mean, I didn't even look at the guy to say, I mean, it, that was not even the point anymore. I don't even know who that guy is. That guy, I, I don't remember anything about that guy. God bless him. I just remember that now there are tears coming down my face and I'm like, this is unreal. This is unreal. This is a miracle. This is God at work. This is God doing the unthinkable. Who could organize this? Tee it up, set it up and unfold it just like this. We're right in a moment where people are saying that can't happen and that shouldn't happen and that's not important that an actual college student rises up, opens her journal, and reads basically what we have just proclaimed that God is doing in the nation. That girl made it to Memphis, Tennessee. She made it to One Day 2000, but she made it to the bins also. I mean, I don't know physically that she was in there, but I know when we stood there, I'll tell you why we were bold. I'll tell you why we stepped out in faith. I'll tell you why we said God's going to do it. I'll tell you why we kept believing that he was going to come through because we have a history of the faithful, miraculous provision of Almighty God. He's done it again and 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 again in our lives. And you do too. You do too. It's called the installment plan. And it's not you paying a little bit every month to get something you can't afford. It's God depositing something you could never do into your story on the installment plan so that when you need it, you can cash in all the belief that you need to be bold in the moment to roar that my God is greater 
and He is going to come through for me.